sermon time, would you pray with me? Holy God, you lifted up your son so that all may be gathered to you. Send us your Holy Spirit now. Spur us to prophetic action and inspire us with new dreams of the kingdom world for our world today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be an utter delight to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. It's in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, beloved, as we turn to yet another parable of Jesus today, I can't help but feeling a little bit like Jacob at Peniel. For the last six months on Wednesday night Bible study, we've been reading through G Genesis, the beginning origin stories of the Bible, these stories of our faith that are helping us find inspiration and courage in this year of creativity here at Union. And a few weeks ago, we read the story of Jacob wrestling with God at Peniel in Genesis 32. Perhaps you know this story. Jacob was returning home after nearly 20 years after he had wronged his brother Esau and stolen his blessing. And on the night before he was to see his brother again, expecting the worst retribution that he should expect, Jacob was alone at Peniel, and there a man appeared. And before he knew it, Jacob and the man were wrestling, struggling with one another, seeking to prevail against the other. Seeking a final blow, the man knocked Jacob's hip out of joint, but Jacob persisted. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so the man said, okay, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, the one who strives with God. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. And as the sun rises, Jacob walks away with a double blessing, a new name to remind him of who he is and a new limp to remind him of his humanity. Beloved, I must confess that wrestling with our text today has me feeling a little bit like Jacob wrestling with God at Peniel. In fact, any time I wrestle with one of Jesus' parables, I am wrestling with God, struggling to make sense of what I am reading, striving to find the word of God within the words. And if I'm honest, often I am seeking to prevail against the text hoping for a singular thread of meaning that I can pull on and tie into a nice bow so that we can go home with a nicely packaged moral or two. And I confess there is a part of me that's just wanting to get a handle on, trying to control a text. And yet, by the awful grace of God, the parables wrestle back. Parables resist quick interpretation. Parables elude easy meaning and cookie-cutter answers. This is part of their brilliance and their staying power as religious teachings of Jesus. Parables are designed to teach us a lesson and perhaps more importantly, they are designed to reveal truth, to help us experience truth. And often the truth being revealed is not just the moral per se, but also a reminder for the reader that the truth of God cannot be captured. The truth of God cannot be easily broken down into three-point sermonettes or tracts of Bible verses that lack interpretation. The truth of God cannot be domesticated or conquered. Beloved, parables remind us that we enter into the text to wrestle with God, not in order to prevail against God, but instead to strive with God, demanding a blessing. And God will never leave us empty-handed, beloved. In fact, an encounter with the word of God should leave us transformed, maybe even limping away, holding a new, a new name in our hearts. So let us enter our text this morning with this simple assurance, that while we may not walk away with easy answers, we can trust that as we persevere in the wrestling, God will bless us. So our scripture reading this morning from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, it's from the lectionary. You know, this book, lead, uh, list of readings that Christians around the world read every Sunday together. So Christians around the world are wrestling with this parable with us, beloved, as we approach this text with faith-seeking understanding. And we turn to this parable of the ten bridesmaids. Jesus said, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. 
Ten ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five are wise and five are foolish. The wise ones bring extra oil and the five foolish ones do not bring extra oil. But in all other ways, the ten are the same. Waiting for the bridegroom throughout the night, getting drowsy and falling asleep. But at midnight, the call goes out of the bridegroom's arrival and the ten bridesmaids prepare their lamps for his arrival. And the foolish... (laughs) They make a demand of the wise. They say, give us your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the wise reply to them, there just won't be enough oil to go around. Go into the marketplace and buy some for yourselves. And in a cruel stroke of fate, the bridegroom arrives while the foolish are off buying their oil. And those ready to enter the wedding banquet go in and the door is sealed. When the foolish return, the bridegroom rejects them outright and says, I do not know you. Jesus says, be prepared, therefore, for you neither know the hour nor the day. Okay, deep breath. Right off the bat, this parable can be a lot. This parable that alludes to the end times, the apocalypse, it might fill you with some anxiety. Yes, for many of us, this stirs up age-old existential anxiety about who gets in and who doesn't get in to heaven. So as we begin, let's take that conversation and put it to the side. (laughs) Because while this parable is often interpreted as being about the the apocalypse, we will instead approach it as an apocalyptic parable. With so much cultural baggage around this word, it's important to remember that apocalypse is just the Greek word for revelation. Revelation or unveiling. And so we can approach this apocalyptic parable for what it is, one that is to reveal or unveil something true in our world. And so the first unveiling is this. Apocalyptic parables are less about prophesying the future as they are about prophetic words for the present moment. I'll say that again. (laughs) Apocalyptic parables are less about prophesying the future And they are more about the prophetic words that we need for the present moment. At Union, we like to talk about prophecy not as the practice of fortune telling as of the future, but telling good fortunes for the poor, which often means bad news for the poor. And we know that this is how Christ, or bad news for the rich and powerful. And, And we know that this is how Christ's prophetic words were received because the rich and powerful went out of their way to silence him. The prophetic imagination envisions an alternative future, beloved, a new story with new possibilities. And for those who benefit from the status quo, this dreaming, this imagination, these possibilities are threatening. So as we seek to deepen our understanding of this parable, it's important to look at the narrative context. Because this parable is couched in the middle of what is called the Olivet Discourse. It's the fifth and final section of teachings that Jesus has in the Gospel of Matthew. So the first series of of teachings, the first sermon we have on the Mount in Galilee, well, this is the fifth one. It's on the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem. Now, the location and timing, then, are critical here, beloved. In the previous scene, Jesus had arrived in Jerusalem on a donkey. And he walked into the temple to disrupt the business that was going in there by turning over the the tables. And this was followed by Jesus going in and having these confrontational teachings against the religious elite of his day, against the scribes and the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he did all this in the temple, the very center of religious activity in the kingdom. When Jesus is done, he leaves the temple He leaves the city center, he crosses the valley of Josephat, and climbs the Mount of Olives. And I think it's important to note that the Mount of Olives was a funeral ridge. So he passed by the graves of his ancestors, and he let the grief of all that was before him wash over him. You see, the Mount of Olives overlooked the temple. And it was at the margins, and they were able to see the whole picture when Jesus was talking. Jesus saw that God's city had become a place corrupted by money and power. A devastating conflation of empire and religion that conspired to oppress the people and extract wealth for the top 1%. A temple that had become a place of exploitative big business rather than a place of worship. 
To be a little anachronistic, Jesus was lamenting the gentrification of Jerusalem. He was lament lamenting the fact that prophets had become more important than people where historic faithfulness was now being forgotten and being replaced with Roman values and practices. Whoever decided that worship should be a money-making business? Whoever decided that housing should be a money-making business? Now I have to wonder that maybe this is not just one or it is a large part of the thrust of this parable of the ten bridesmaids. Because you see, the bridesmaids were similar. They awaited on the arrival of the bridegroom. They brought lamps, and they even fell asleep together. In other words, this parable is offering an internal critique for his people, the Jewish community all waiting for their Messiah. And yet the distinguishing characteristic is that the foolish are named such because they did not bring extra oil. Given this context, I have to wonder if the foolish ones did not bring extra oil because they are the religious elites, those who would become comfortable with their privilege and exploitation. Yes, we must ask, why didn't they bring extra oil? Perhaps they'd become accustomed to the plenty that they always had, never having to bring a little extra just in case. Perhaps they'd grown accustomed to stealing from the poor. And maybe more to the point, perhaps they thought that their money would save them. Because if they ever needed anything, they could just go and buy it in the marketplace. The response of the wise to the foolish seems to support this idea. Go to the dealers and buy yourselves some more oil. In other words, go back to that temple marketplace you helped set up. Isn't that where you normally get what you need? Isn't that where you tell us to go when we are in need of something for temple worship? And so the foolish trust in their own foolishness, having drank their own Kool-Aid, so to speak. And it's their own misguided reliance on consumer religion that makes them miss the arrival of the bridegroom, Christ himself. The conclusion of the parable tells us the meaning that we're supposed to be getting out of this. Keep awake, beloved. Be prepared, for you neither know the day nor the hour that Christ will return. So what does it mean to be prepared for the coming of God's Messiah? Well, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, the answer might be simply put as this. Faithful discipleship. Faithful discipleship. It's the kind of discipleship, the following of Christ that is born of faith in Christ and is lived out faithfully to the way of Christ. Discipleship here is less about overt religious offerings and more about justice. Discipleship is not something that can be bought and sold in the marketplace. Instead, it's something that must be cultivated day after day, like an olive tree or like a healthy relationship. I wonder if the oil is representative of the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits of discipleship, the fruits of love and action that are our treasures in heaven. In that case, faithfulness is less about having it all together, but instead about attuning ourselves to the very Spirit of the living God, asking for and trusting in God's presence. I can't help but hear resonances of the Lord's Prayer here. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not this world, but your world, God. Not the death-dealing ways of this world, but your life-giving ways be done, God. Not the will of the market, but the will of love. And God, give us this day our daily bread. Give us every little thing that we need. Attune us to your spirit. Nourish our bodies and our spirits. Beloved, we are invited out of the anxiety of this world and out of the next worldly anxiety because instead we may trust in God's grace, trust in God's love, and trust that God will work all things for the good of those who love him and trust in his grace. So the parable seems to be saying something like this. The treasures of this world cannot replace the treasures of heaven. Put another way, money cannot replace the relational work of discipleship. True religion cannot be bought and sold, but it must be cultivated in-house, must be baked from scratch, so to speak. Christ warns us, do not outsource your spirituality. 
or else you will miss out on Christ's kingdom, which is already at hand. Christ's inbreaking reality that is already incarnating among you. Because heaven isn't a future promise, beloved. It is an imminent reality. Now, it's important to remember that apocalyptic imagery is not meant to discourage us, but rather to inspire us to radical prophetic action. It is meant to drive us to the divine urgency that the future isn't so far future, but is actually here right now at hand. It is polarizing rhetoric for the sake of change. And this is valuable. This is the work of an activist. And again, it's important to recognize when somebody is engaging prophetic rhetoric and when they're actually casting a vision of how things ought to be in the end. Christ models to us that both of these are important parts of the kingdom work. Prophetic calls to change our ways and prophetic imagining of what is possible. And this parable is definitely a prophetic call to action, a call to repentance, a warning to the people of God to get our act together. And still, when I hear this, something about this parable inspires the need for reimagination because something doesn't fully sit right in my spirit. Something in here doesn't sound like the abundant love of God, the abundant grace of Christ that we know and love. And in fact, the binary of wise and foolish rings anxiously like the binaries of this world. This sounds awfully like the very limited vision of the kingdom that Jesus was trying to counteract with his own kingdom vision. So as Pastor Jay has been inviting us in the last few weeks as of de-gentrifying our minds, how might we bring a critical imagination to this parable? How might we dissolve the binaries that entrap us in a scarcity mentality, in an us versus them mentality, in a zero-sum game mentality? I think about the words of visiting professor Dr. David Anderson Hooker, who asks, what if we imagined a world in which there were no disposable people? What if we imagined a world in which there were no disposable people? In this view, perhaps then the parable is not saying this is how things will be, but instead this is our current trajectory. <laughs> We live in a world where people are being used up and are being discarded when they are no longer productive, where people are displaced when they can no longer afford to live in the neighborhood of their birth. But we can choose differently. Amen, beloved? We can choose differently. We can cultivate a community where there is enough oil to go around. We can cultivate a kingdom community where no one is disposable. We can cultivate a kingdom community where no parts of ourselves are disposable. So in the end, Christ gives us this warning. Keep awake, beloved. Be prepared, for you know neither the hour nor the day. Christ is bringing the prospect of heaven, of the future, right here into the present. So hear the good news, beloved. Christ is already here. Heaven is at hand. The Spirit of God is already available to us, and we can enter into that divine communion now with God and with one another. We can reimagine this world in Christ's kingdom vision and make sure that no one is disposable. Because in the end, we need each other. We need each other to survive. Thanks be to God. Amen.